Building a Just World Order. Sheila Flood, Sharon Welsh, and I have spent the past year studying and teaching about a new book, Global Governance and the Emergence of Global Institutions for the 21st Century. This is a wonderful scholarly book that happens to be written by three Baha'is. It has become a global reference for discussions about reforming or replacing the United Nations. As we read the book, we realized that Baha'u'llah's vision for, of a world commonwealth is not something that might happen in 200 years, but something that is emerging right now. At the same time that the world is facing unprecedented crises, we are also moving toward global unity. We are watching climate chaos reaching an emergency level. The threat of nuclear war is increasing at the very time we finally have a treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons. And we are in the middle, or perhaps the end, of a pandemic. The fourth threat is the fragile state of our financial system with its obscene inequality of wealth distribution. Global crises demand global solutions, but the United Nations is inadequate to address the scale of governance needed unless it is reformed. The book offers proposals for reform, and we are now seeing them start to be adopted, whether or not people have read the book or are even aware of the book. Let me start with the history that we need. This is Abdul Baha when he was um, on his speaking tour of the United States, and he's in Jersey City, New Jersey in 1912. He said, spiritual advancement may be likened to the light of the early dawn. Although this dawn light is dim and pale, a wise man who views the march of the sunrise at its very beginning can foretell the ascendancy of the sun in its full glory and effulgence. This 20th century is the dawn or beginning of spiritual illumination, and it is evident that day by day it will advance. He said that even though he knew that um, World War I was about to begin. During the First World War, Abdu'l-Bahá was in Palestine, and correspondence with the rest of the world was limited, actually limited to delivery of mail by hand. Meanwhile, in The Hague, people were starting to a movement to end war. One of the organization, one of the organizations with tens of thousands of members, was the Central Organization for a Durable Peace. It published its constitution in newspapers all over the world. This was read by Mr. Ahmad Yazdani, who, in consultation with Hand of the Cause, Mr. Ibni Astag, wrote a, a paper to the organization, informing them about the Baha'i principles and suggesting they seek guidance from Abdu Baha regarding their aim to establish universal peace. The organization wrote a letter through Mr. Yazdani to Abdu Baha, dated February 11, 1916. When the letter arrived, Abdu Baha revealed the tablet to The Hague. Unfortunately, it could not be delivered until June of 1920, when it was delivered in person by Mr. Yazdani and Mr. Ibn Azdaq. The letter was dated February 11, 1916, but it took many years to get there because of the war. By the time the letter arrived, the organization had already been disbanded in June of 1919, after the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. This is U.S. President Woodrow Wilson, who was very highly esteemed by uh, Shoghi Effendi. U.S. President Woodrow Wilson proposed 14 points needed to build peace after the First World War. Shoghi Effendi commented that his thinking was clearly influenced by Abdul Baha's writings. Apparently, Wilson's daughter was very interested in Baha'i teachings and had been following um, lectures and so on in New York. And there is some evidence that uh, Woodrow Wilson carried a copy of a book by Abdu'l Baha on divine philosophy in his jacket pocket. Well, he was unable to convince the other leaders who were interested in their own power and wealth rather than in the principles of peace. And this is a picture of Paris, 1919, uh, this gathering of all men, dividing up the world uh, through the Treaty of Versailles. It did end the First World War 
It demanded punishing repar reparations from Germany, and it divided the world with new boundaries to suit the great powers of the time. They had huge maps and they drew these lines with rulers, with no regard at all for people's languages, their ethnicity, or their original nationality. And we are still living with the consequences of those decisions. At that time, however, President Wilson laid the groundwork for the League of Nations, which was founded in 1920. Abdu'l-Bahá supported the League of Nations, but he knew that it was not going to succeed because it did not have a tribunal with authority to take action against any country that tried to start a war. When Woodrow Wilson took the proposal for the United States to join the League of Nations, uh, he took it to the Senate, this is a photograph of that, that they refused to join the League. Well, the League was crippled. In fact, it was weak for several reasons. First of all, they had decided on consensus decision-making, and that seems to be fair because it gives everyone an equal vote, but the problem is it means that everyone has a veto, and nations bent on starting a war would simply veto any discussions that would have halted it. The goal was not to end wars, but to limit them to the ones that uh, were approved by the great powers. Nationalism prevented cooperation. And, of course, the U.S. Senate, refusing to join, weakened it enormously. By the time the Second World War was brewing, it was clear that the League of Nations was not effective. In the middle of the Second World War, leading thinkers were developing proposals for a United Nations that would replace the League. And these proposals were widely discussed by Albert Einstein, Bertrand Russell, Grenville Clark, and other prominent intellectuals, all of whom were writing uh, copiously about this. Various proposals were circulated during the war and most of them favored a general assembly that included citizens who were concerned with the common good rather than national interests. There would also be weighted voting for nation states to take into account population and economic status. Unfortunately, Stalin demanded a veto and it seemed likely that the U.S. Senate would follow. So this is the United Nations we have now. The result is that we have 193 countries in the General Assembly. They can make treaties and agreements, but they do not have power of enforcement by law. Just a side note, it is amazing how much the United Nations has accomplished by the power of moral suasion. In fact, most countries obey the treaties that they have signed, so the uh, issue of legal enforcement is not as strong as, as we might think. They do have um, uh, the, the Security Council, however. The Security Council has 15 members, five of which are permanent members, the great powers of 1945, the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Russia, and China and each of those countries has a veto. The result of that has been that some 200 wars were not prevented or ended by the Security Council. Bertrand Russell and Albert Einstein continued to call for changes to ensure world peace. They were very, very much concerned about nuclear weapons and the threat they posed to the entire world. And they issued a manifesto on July 9, 1955. They raised the alarm about nuclear weapons and called for the great powers to move toward world peace. They proposed a conference which was actually held. It was sponsored by Cyrus Eaton and held in Pugwash, Nova Scotia two years later. Unfortunately, Einstein had died by then. Reform ideas have circulated ever since, but they've not succeeded in gaining support. And this is a major role for civil society. So what has changed since 1945 that makes reform possible today? First of all, the urgency. The threats we face now are threats to our very survival. We must be able to address them. And the second is the context of civil society as a second superpower. Civil society, I'll just explain, um, there, there are three pillars to a healthy government. There's the government itself, 
there is the financial sector, and then there is civil society, which is the conscience that holds both of those other pillars to account. Civil society was called the second superpower in uh, 2003 when 30 million people around the world took to the streets to object to the U U.S. plans to bomb Iraq. This was the second Iraq war. And uh, that because of that, the New York Times read, uh, ran a line that said, um, it seems that the world still has a second superpower, and that is public opinion. So that's civil society. We didn't succeed in stopping that war, but it certainly changed the context, and it's made it much, much more difficult for countries to start wars today because the public will not back them. Three major influences have evolved since the First World War. The role of women is enormously important. We are seeing more and more leaders of countries are women, and the role of women at the United Nations, in public health departments, and so on, has made it really clear that they provide much-needed leadership. Secondly is the greatly increased role of civil society, and I will talk a lot about that in the last session of this workshop series of workshops. And finally, strengthening international law has been going forward very quickly with profound changes, and we'll address some of those later in this, in this course. This is a slide that really surprises all of us, including me. It's from uh, PRIO, which is the Peace Research Institute of Oslo. Well, that's a very uh, reputable and distinguished peace research institute in Norway. It shows that wars are decreasing. And if you look at the left-hand side, you see wars not only um, international wars, with many, many battle deaths. This graph is of de uh, battle deaths per 100,000 population. So a huge number during the First World War. And of those, there are also a number that are in colonial wars. So the colonial wars are the dark bars at the bottom. Um, and you can see that the colonial wars gradually decline as more and more um, nations are broken up and, and uh, gain their independence. You also see intrastate wars. Um, going across the chart, we see the uh, Vietnam War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and the wars in Afghanistan. And then you notice in the 21st century that wars are really, really decreasing. No interstate wars. And really the only blip is at the very end, which is the continuing war in Syria. So why are there fewer wars? Well, there are research scholars at the um, Lew Institute at the University of British Columbia who have asked this very question, and they say there are fewer wars because of the United Nations and its powerful effect on nation building, the increasing role of international law, and the increasing role of civil society. I have added to their list the role of women uh, their list came out in 2005, and really the role of women has become more and more evident in the, in the last um, 15 years. I want to close with a quotation from The Promise of World Peace, and we'll return to this quotation again in other, other sessions. The primary challenge in dealing with issues of peace is to raise the context to the level of principle as distinct from pure pragmatism. For in essence, peace stems from an inner state supported by a spiritual or moral attitude, and it is chiefly in evoking this attitude that the possibility of enduring solutions can be found. Very hopeful statement. <laughs>